All right, welcome to week 11. Apparently, now that I've double checked the calendar, 10, 11 ish. Um, I was supposed to hand out the assignment last week. Then I remember too late to hand it out. So it's going to get handed out this week, just so you know, uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, this shouldn't take too long. Um, so this presentation is pretty much the end of the stuff that's on the final exam. There's going to be a tiny little bit from the next set of presentations, but this is the end of the bulk of the meat of the course as of this week for examable examination material. I always like to announce this at this point because, you know, people ask me, up till when do I need to study? There it is, folks. Okay. And so what I'm talking about this week is two or three topics, indexes, views, and partitions. Those are the big ones. And I'm going to start with indexes. Indexes is an important concept uh, because it helps speed up complex queries. It gives you the ability to um, give the database server extra tools to help it find the data you're searching for. Um, queries have advantages and disadvantages. I'll cover some of the disadvantages at the end. Um, but for example, on the screen I've got a query, select star from person where name is equal to Smith. And what this is going to do is it does a sequential scan. This means it starts reading the first record in the database. Does it say, is it equal to Smith? No. There's the next one. Which, you know, if you have 25,000 rows, it'll happen like that. If you have 25 million rows, it's going to go, oh, take a while. Because it's got to read every single row. So what the indexes are going to do is they allow you to speed up the search by creating special structures that it uses to look things up. Now, for starters, there's index file organization. So what happens is it stores records sequentially or non-sequentially. Some database servers still store the records sequentially and some don't. Uh, but there is an index file, let's call it a file, that allows software to locate individual records quicker. So instead of reading through the entire table, it'll go read the index, and then the index tells it, oh, anybody whose name is Smith is in locations 1, 12, and 44. So then it just needs to go grab those three locations and pull the data back. Um, an index is a ta table of data structure that determines exactly where things are. Um, primary keys are automatically indexed. They're always indexed. They cannot be not indexed. Uh, by nature, primary keys are used to find records quickly. Therefore, they have to be indexed. Goes without saying. Other fields or combinations of fields can also be indexed. These are known as secondary keys or non-unique keys. So you can index a single field. You can index multiple fields. There's advantages to both. Now, indexes, the most common index you'll find in a database server is known as a B tree index. And up till not that long ago, I used to think they were called binary tree indexes. And then I was disabused of my knowledge. The B tree stands for best tree, not binary tree. So I, I went along for 15 years thinking they were called binary tree until somebody proved to me I was wrong. So, you yeah, know, we all learned something. Now, the way B trees work, and hopefully my next slide actually has a better example. The way B trees work is it takes the data and starts subdividing it into subcategories. So it can go down to four levels of divisions. And when it divides, it'll separate out into different uh, groupings. So let's say you have data that goes from A to Z. At the first level, it'll go A to M, N to Z. 
it'll divide it evenly. The next level down, we'll take the A to M, divide that in two. And the fourth level down, I'll take, you know, A to E and divide that in two. So then when it searches through the records, it'll go, oh, where is anybody's name who starts with S? It'll go, okay, S. Is that after M? Yes. Bang. Now is S in the first half of the second half after M? Yes, it's in the first half. It'll go down to that one. It'll go, okay, now is it in the second, which of the two halves that is it going to be in? And then it'll go, oh, there it is. Divide it again. Um, and in the end, instead of having searched through, say, 25 million rows, it might need to scroll, crawl through 10,000 rows. And we know 10,000 rows is fast to loop through. Now, the division going sideways isn't a divide by two operation. It's a divide by the, the best combination of operations. So if there's 20 million rows, the first tree may have five or six leaves broken down into the most obvious chunks. And then it'll take those leaves and divide them and divide them and divide them. Um, so by the time it gets to the fourth level, it could go out hundreds of leaves wide. It looks like a big tree, but sitting upside down. Now, when you go to create an index, the syntax in SQL is like this. Create index, give it a name. Who cares what you call it? You're never actually gonna use that name ever again unless you wanna delete the index. So create index, name of the index on, table, brackets, field or fields. So it'll either be one field or multiple fields. So the previous slide showed you a creating on a single field, which is on a person's name. If you want to create on more than one column, attribute or field, you can come and delimit it. So if you do create index, and for the example called the double index on person, age, and city, that means to create an index that indexes two separate columns at the same time. So what happens with the index is when you write a query and the index will help the speed things up based on the where clause. So whatever you put in your where clause will be sped up by the index. So in this example is select star from persons where the age is 55 and the city is Seattle. So what it'll do is it'll hit that double index and it'll be sped up because both those columns are in that index. On the other hand, if you just did select star from person where the city is equal to Seattle, it won't help because there isn't an index that matches the combination of where, or it doesn't match the combination of the predicates. Um, if you had three predicates and two of the predicates match one of the indexes, it'll use that index. If only one column matches any of the combo indexes, then it won't use any of them. So there's a, you have to be careful when you plan your indexes because you can actually cause conflicting indexes. Um, that's create an index on a person's age. It'll help with ranges. So if you give it a range of numbers, it'll speed things up um, because it's indexed. Um, it'll basically find the records that match inside that range faster. So it doesn't need to scan the whole database. It knows exactly where those records are. Um, but just before I move on to this, I just want to make sure I don't forget the most important one. Um, there's something called hashing. Thankfully, some of the other profs think this is really important. I think it's not important at level one. And thankfully, the exam does not have any questions or almost no questions on hashing. Um, essentially, you just have to understand what a hash is. Um, so the way the hashing algorithm works is it looks at the position of a record in the database and it uses the hash to determine the actual position. So it uses, it'll group them in lists and base it on that. It's a very awkward system. It's good for certain things. Um, but it's a very niche uh, usage. Um, so essentially the way it works is with, it'll match up the positions of the records in a hash list and then look through that hashed list to determine where it is. Have you guys learned about arrays yet? Maybe. 
Some people are saying yes and some people are saying no. So either one group is right or the other group is right. Okay. <coughs> Makes it really hard to talk about hashes if you don't know about arrays. Um, so a picture, I'm trying to figure out how to even word this. People, I don't know how to use arrays. Maybe I'll just skip it. There we go. There's no point trying to explain it if you guys don't have the knowledge behind for me to be able to explain how it behaves. Uh, the booklet actually does have a paragraph on hash algorithms. And uh, as long as you can memorize that paragraph, you'll do fine. Just memorize the words. That's all an exam's about anyways. Okay. Um, There's two kinds of indexes. There's the primary index, which is unique. And normally it's done for primary keys. However, you could also apply unique index to other fields. For example, you have a database of customers and you don't want to allow certain values to be duplicated, such as a person's SIN number or maybe their email address or a username. You might want to create unique indexes on those. That'll actually, if you try to insert a duplicate value, the database server will say, no, dude, you suck. Don't do this. You should have checked first before you try to put it in. It actually returns an error. Duplicate value, attempt, attempt to insert duplicate value. Um, the secondary indexes, it's for fields that are used to group individual entities, such as zip codes or categories. Now, this is the important stuff. Rules for using indexes. Because basically put, the concept is you create an index, it makes your queries faster, right? And a lot of people, when they first start out, think indexes are the shit. They're great. So they use them and they abuse them. As in, they'll create an index for every single column. And every combination of column they could think of they could ever query in the database. Now, there's implications to that, which I'll be discussing very momentarily. However, when you create indexes, you should use them on larger tables. Don't even bother using them on reference tables. It'll give you zero gains. Not worth it. Obviously, the primary key is always indexed. You should index search fields that are frequently used in your where clause. So if you have a database where you search by phone numbers, index the phone number. If you search by postal code, index the postal code. If you search on a combination of postal code and phone number, maybe index the combination of the two. Um, if you search by names, maybe index the names too. Just don't create a one index that has all the columns. You'll create individual indexes with the combinations that make the most sense. Another set of fields you may want to index are the ones you find in the order by or the group by clause because that will also speed up the processing of the aggregate functions for the group by and the order by is if you're sorting by something. But most people will sort by the primary key or sort by a field they're searching in anyway, so you know, odds are you've already indexed this. Now, you should also index when you have more than 100 values, but this slide is based on really old information. Um, essentially, most computers nowadays are so powerful that there's no point indexing if there's less than 1,000 rows. So start indexing at 1,000 rows and up. Um, I really need to update my slide. When this slide was originally created, people were still operating on 32-bit uh, computers, and the requirements for this program was a computer with four gigs of RAM. Just saying. Um, and even that slide was old by that standard. But uh, realistically, if there's a thousand values, you might want to start indexing. But ThinkCube, you guys have been playing inside of ThinkCube for a little bit. There's not a single index in there except for primary keys. You don't even notice it. Okay, avoid indexes for fields with really long values. I don't mean like a person's last name if they're French. That's not a long value. Even a 75 character email address is not a long value. But if it's a field with 255 characters, 
you might not want to index the whole thing. You may want to actually create hashes or fingerprints of the contents and search against those. Um, now, if the point of the index is to help determine the location of the record, use surrogate keys. Um, it'll actually allow for an even spread inside the index because it'll build the index automatically based on the, numer the numerics and it'll actually build the spread automatically. Whereas if you're using alphanumeric, it has a hard time guessing where things need to go into the index and you end up having to run index rebuilds on a regular basis. Some servers handle the index rebuild just fine. Some servers don't handle the index rebuild so well. Um, some servers may have a limit of the number of indexes per table. Postgres doesn't, realistically. Um, MySQL finally got over its index issues. Uh, for a long time, Microsoft SQL Server gave you 25 indexes per table. They said that's more than enough, just like 640K of RAM is enough. Um, now, here's the kicker, the most important of all the rules. If you're going to index a column that has null values in it, don't bother, index it. Um, most database servers will not recognize null values in an index search. So that means that any row that has a null value, but the column is indexed and you search that column in the where clause, it'll start excluding the null columns. As in, it says if these rows don't even exist at all. So it actually start having um, partial matches in your index. And a partial match is bad because that means the whole thing is slow, which at that point is going to go, hey, I only found, I was only able to search 20,000 rows and there's 25,000. Why is that? Oh, there's nulls. Well then, guess what we're doing next? Sequential scan, top to bottom. All right. Now, before I go to the next slide, I'm going to talk about some of the impacts of indexes. And when, like I said, when people first start out and they're nice and squeaky and green and, you know, a little wet behind the ears, they think all problems can be solved by an index. Now, take into account the following things. Every write to the database, every time you insert, update, or delete something in the database, it is one disk operation plus N. N means number of indexes. Now the N is not, you know, if there's two indexes, N is two. With N, it's actually N squared. So we're doing some algebra math here, right? God, you're glad you're taking math right now. So here's the logic. We have a table with three indexes. It has a primary key, so there's one index, and then we've indexed a person's name and their postal code. So, you know, so there's three indexes on the table. And we have a combination of name and postal code also, so four indexes total. And we are going to insert a new row in the database. Step one, write the value to the database. So that's write operation number one. Right operation number two, read the first, the primary key index. Find the right spot to insert the value. Write the index back. That's three, right? Now, every other index is also three operations minimum. So if we had four times three is 12 operations plus the initial write. So we're inserting one row of data. We just caused 12 IO, 13 IO operations minimum for writing one value into the database. That's only four indexes. So let's make that eight indexes. The number's going to keep growing. And you're going to start hitting what's called IO bottleneck, where there's only so much that can happen to the database. Um, and that was for a simple read and write. Um, there's only so much that can happen. So you're just going to keep writing and writing and writing to the database. And to the disk, and the disk is just going to sit there and slow down. So all the other operations are queued up behind this one insert because you were overzealous with your indexes. Um, that's impact number one. Impact number two is disk space. 
Now people say, ah, oh, we've got gigabyte drives. Yay. Terabyte drives. Wonderful. Now, there once was a time where we didn't have drives that size. And the following information was significantly more important back in the day. And has anybody in here ever priced out server-grade hard drives as opposed to normal desktop-grade hard drives? What's the price differential? Yeah. So if you want to get an enterprise-grade drive, which has a guaranteed life of five years, which also runs at 10,000 RPM, right? Assuming they're platter disks and not SSDs. Let's not even going to talk about SSDs made for enterprise. It's not three times the price. It's 10 times the price uh, for long life SSDs. So what we end up doing in enterprise is we buy a lot of small drives and put them in a RAID array. So we cluster the drives together. It's a bunch of small drives. So that means, you know, you could go and buy yourself a crappy 550, 400 RPM, two terabyte drive to put in your laptop. That might put you back 110 bucks. On the enterprise drives, a two terabyte RAID array will put you back, you know, 10 grand. Because you need all the hardware to supp supplement it. So we tend to not put as much disk space per server because they cost so much. Not everybody has bottomless budgets, like the federal government, for IT. So we have smaller disks. Now, here's the impact. So let's say your table occupies 10 megabytes on the disk. It's a pretty small table. Actually, 10 megabytes is actually a lot of data. 10 megabytes on the disk. And your primary key array might occupy 1 megabyte. So now we're sitting at 11 megs, right? So then our name index might be 2 megs. Our postal code index might be 2 megs. The combination of the name and the postal code might be 3 megs because, you know, the way it stores the data inside the index isn't a linear algorithm. So suddenly we're at... Uh, Two, four, five, plus three is eight. So our 10 megabyte table is occupying 18 megs. Still doesn't sound like a lot of room. Let's now let's scale that up to a, t a gigabyte table where you're storing, you know, 16 million rows. You know, we went from, t okay, let's even just go with single gigabyte table. It'll occupy 1.8 gigs or more. And that's with four indexes. If you've got five or six indexes, suddenly your indexes occupy more disk space than the actual data itself, and which causes a different kind of problem. A, you run out of disk space. B, your backups are huge. C, the amount of I.O. you're causing that disk to suffer is mildly exciting for everyone because the more I.O. you do to the disk, the faster it dies. It's just the way it is, right? The more you use something, the faster it wears out. And with SSDs, you know, they'll wear out faster than a spin disk. Why? Because it can be written and written, uh, read and written so many times. And if you're constantly reading and writing the index tables, it's constantly rewriting the same space of the memory, eventually the drives will die. Um, so, so far I've talked about I.O., I've talked about disk space. The third impact... is it affects the query planner. Bye. Holy Lord, he didn't even make it half an hour. I know it's not exciting, but hey. <laughs> now, the last one is the query planner. Now, we don't really talk about the query planner at this level of the course of, of database because really it's an advanced topic. However, there's a little bit of thinking that happens. Every time you ask, ask the server to run a query, it has to decide how it's going to retrieve the data. It's going to look at what you're connecting, what the indexes are that are available, and make some choices. And if you give it too many choices, it doesn't know what to do, so it gives up. And it uses either the best guess, or it chooses to use none at all. So anybody here ever go to a restaurant where the menu is like this thick? And you know what the problem is, right? 
there's too many options. So you sit there going, what am I going to eat? I forget, I'll have a beer. Liquid food. I'm not even going to bother. Give me some french fries and some nachos. I won't even try anything on the menu because the menu is too complex. There's too many options. The database here does something similar. If you've got indexes that cover three or four different combinations of the where clause, and it happens that those fields are used more in one place and more than one index, it gets to the point where it tries to guess the, the best index to use. And if it decides that there's two indexes that are equally suitable and it can't make a choice between them, it chooses to use none. And it does a sequential scan. Or it may choose to do, use one, but there might be one index that's slightly better because of the combination of the fields would be faster if it used this other index, but because this one seems to be more appropriate in its mind, it'll use an inferior index. And the queries aren't going to run as fast. Or it'll use two indexes and it'll actually confuse itself. Don't overdo the indexes. Just index what needs to be indexed. Keep it minimal. The fewer indexes you have, usually the better life is, as long as they, you, they target the things you're indexing. Um, an example of this is where I'm working now, where we had a couple of tables where we chose not to index years ago because we're trying to limit the amount of I.O. rights because the servers were old. We're talking that originally the server was at Pentium 4. Now, that's, you know, most of you probably went, what the hell is that? Figure Windows 2000 grade, you know. The server had lots of RAM, had 500 megs of RAM. Not 500 gigs, 500 megs, like half a gig. And it was a good machine. So we were trying to limit the amount of I.O. happening because this poor machine couldn't keep up with the database. So a few years ago, one of our data, some of our database got so big that some of the queries were starting going really, really slow. And then I created an index. And suddenly the queries, instead of taking three minutes to run, were running in 10 seconds. That was a good index to create. At the same time, we had an index on phone numbers. And a, com a weird combination, because some sales guy was always using this weird combination of search fields. So we created an index to make his life better. And what happened in the end is the index ended up being 20% larger than the table it was based on. It was absurd because the index was fragmenting as it was going. So the index was rewriting itself constantly because the combination of fields was bad. So suddenly we had it, it was occupying this table had dead index entries. So we had to run a routine every three days to purge this index and recreate it. In the end, we told the guy, just stop it. Just, we're not going to do this index anymore because it's causing too much impact. So there's perks indexes and there's, can there's const indexes. Just be careful when you use them. Okay. So do you remember that lecture, lecture four, part two, where I talked about normalization? There reaches a point where suddenly you realize you normalize too much and now your database sucks because it's too complex to maintain or it's too heavy. So there's something called denormalizing, also turning into non-normalized physical records. So there's some perks. You can improve the performance of the database because it reduces the number of joins. For example, taking the, uh, the states provinces table away and just replacing it, that field with the actual values. That means there's one less join. If you're only dealing with 10,000, 20,000 rows, it doesn't make a difference. If you're dealing with millions and millions of rows, it'll make a big difference. That's the big benefit of denormalizing is speed. There's costs though. Data gets duplicated. We're introducing an anomalies again. We're wasting storage space. So for example, if we had a single table with 30 rows and all these rows had was a primary key and a value, and the other table just had, you know, the numeric foreign key, that doesn't take up a lot of room as opposed to if you're storing the full name of each territory or province or political division. For example, which one occupies more room, the number nine or Newfoundland and Labrador? So you're going to cause your primary table size to grow noticeably because you're not using a number to identify Newfoundland and Labrador. 
even the number 9 is still significantly smaller than NL because it's one character less. And numbers take up less room than alphanumeric characters at that. So, you know, there's that. Um, you have data integrity and consistency threats. In other words, update anomalies, insert anomalies, because you're duplicating data, you have to update stuff everywhere. Imagine if, I don't know, Alberta separates from Canada, because right now that's the most likely separation. Alberta says, to hell with this, we're done with Canada. Justin, go play in your own sandbox. And, not you. Go play in your own sandbox. We're going to become the Republic of Alberta instead. Now you've got to go through the database and change every word that says Alberta to Republic of Alberta. Also, the country becomes the Republic of Alberta because, you know, whatever. And suddenly you have update and integrity issues because you've got to modify so many rows constantly. Now, some common targets is where you have one-to-one -one relationships. Now, I've told you guys to try not to create those because unless you have a really good reason, don't. Um, if you have associative entities, that's also an often, it's a target. So if we remember back, hark back to the first assignment where we were talking about Students and disciplinary actions, right? You had the, the type of incident and you had the student. And for those of us that actually did get in trouble while we were in high school, we ended up in that associative entity several times because you got busted more than once. And you could get rid of that associative entity by getting rid of the... Um, type of incident and just write them into that, you know, student incidents table, you'd get rid of the associative entity by writing the values directly. It's not a good idea unless you really need to. Um, the other one is reference data, reference tables. As I already used that example, you know, states and provinces, countries, status codes, stuff like that. Those are common targets. Now, actually I already covered all of this. Next. And that's partitioning. So one of the common uses of denormalization is data warehousing. Uh, anybody here ever hear the phrase data warehousing? Maybe on the way by when you're actually looking at a, a blog about computing, they might have talked about data warehousing. Kay. Currently, what is the largest corporation outside of a government that has data warehousing that you can think of? Amazon. Amazon's the big one. Uh, they have the biggest data warehouse in the world. They're actually, their data warehouse is bigger than most countries. Uh, they make StatScan look tiny. They know more about us than StatScan does. Well, until they get our, da our banking info, but you know, for the most part, they know more about us than StatScan does if you buy anything from Amazon. Um, what data warehousing does is at the end of every day, they'll summarize the daily transactions and create summary entries into another database. So that the next day, the managers for each of the divisions, whatever it happens to be, whether it's Amazon or a bank or whatever, can go run their reports and instead of hitting a billion rows of data a day, which is Amazon sitting, last time I heard the stats, it's close to 14 billion rows of data, data it creates a day. Amazon Worldwide, 14 billion rows of data a day. They take all that and they summarize it. So this guy might be hitting 1 million rows instead of 14 billion rows. And sometimes those million rows get summarized again so that the reports run faster. Let's just say summarizing a million rows is a lot faster than summarizing 14 billion rows. When you normalize the, denormalize the data, you're basically summarizing it to its most common pieces. You get rid of all... Uh, the reference tables, you get rid of all that stuff, and you end up with a data cube. So do you remember when I talked about the normalization and we were talking about that um, products table? The, the first normal form table that had the, the order number, the customer information, the product price, and the description of the product and the color of the product? Does that ring vaguely a bell? If not, go look at lecture four, part two. It, or part one, it's one of those two, and it's covered in there. And... 
essentially that is basically you're going to take that nice norm you know, that nicely normalized database and you turn it back into that for running reports but you actually summarize the values so there's less joins you don't do that in your main database you want to dump the stuff out nightly and then import it into a secondary database and some servers offer extra functionality for that microsoft serve microsoft sql server has a special storage engine just for that purpose it's designed to make it run faster with that kind of data He'll be back. He left his laptop. Okay. Now, the next topic is partitioning. If I remember right, there's two questions on the exam about this. So out of 100 plus questions, there's two questions about this. Um, there's horizontal partitioning and vertical partitioning. Now, horizontal partitioning is you distribute each of the rows into separate tables. So it's good where people need access to different pieces of information. So for example, let's say you have a table that has a lot of historical information. So it's broken down by year and month. What a horizontal partition will do is it'll separate the data into chunks based on those dates so that you'd have a table for 2017, a table for 2018, a table for 2019. And the data would get broken down into each of those tables so that if you're working with 2017 data, it goes looks at the 2017 table only. Um, it's gross because you have to write code that handles walking across multiple partitions, especially if you're retrieving multiple records. Um, some database servers have it built in, which is cool. Um, I think Postgres now has that functionality where you can define partitions based on certain columns. And as it writes data into those columns, it determines the best set of partitions. It actually creates them automatically. Um, Oracle for sure has it. It'll create the, part the horizontal partitions automatically. On the other side, there's something called vertical partitioning. So it's, let's, let's just say carefully here. So what you're happening is with vertical partitioning, you're separating the columns across multiple tables. So instead of the rows being across multiple tables, it's separate columns. So you end up with a bunch of tables that are one-to-one -one relationships. Um, some of the uh, advantages to that is special access so that, you know, he's allowed to look at certain information. He's allowed to look at different information. But you also need to share a common customer table. So you could look at the customer and this guy pulls up their login information. This guy pulls up their banking information. So he's doing tech support. He's doing financial support. He doesn't need to see the credit card information. He doesn't care the last time they logged in. So you can do vertical partitioning. What are the advantages of vertical partitioning? Um, it makes the return queries smaller because you're returning less data. It allows for much tighter security. So you can lock it down based, based on um, access permissions. Um, if you're using something called table spaces, you can actually put the table each of these tables on different hard drives. That means when you do a search, you can actually search across multiple hard drives at once, which, did you guys learn about RAID arrays? No, and they're not teaching you on Computer Essentials either? Okay, well, how many people here know what a RAID array is? How many of you actually understand how it works? <laughs> See, now we only got like three hands now left over. Five? There is RAID 0. RAID 0 is mirroring. RAID 1 is, no, RAID 1 stripe is 0 stripe. Yeah, 0 is stripe, 1 is mirror. 0 plus 1 is striped and mirrored. RAID 5 is stripe mirror plus, a, uh, plus an extra disk for, um, the uh, no, the, um, it's a redundancy disk, yes, but it serves a purpose with checksums. Yeah. 
and it uses the, the, the extra disk for that purpose. So we, if you do vertical partitions where you have each of the tables on a different disk, that means one of the perks of a RAID array is increased bandwidth, right? Because each drive has its own pipe in and out. That means you can suck data across multiple drives faster. If you have vertical partitions, you can set them up across multiple drives. That means you can suck the data out of the database faster because it's going out through multiple pipes. So it's like the opposite of trying to pull the, you know, you're draining your bathtub by pulling the plug or you shoot a hole in the bottom of the bathtub with a shotgun. You got more holes, the water's going to go down faster. Same deal, vertical partitioning does that. Um, so the advantages of partitioning, records used together or grouped together. That means that the data that is commonly used regularly is in one place. Often older records will be put on slower disks. So you could have the current partition sitting on the SSD and the previous partition sitting, sitting on a spin disk. Who cares? It's slow. We don't need to get to that data very often. Um, each partition, partition can be optimized for performance. Uh, some database servers are kind of cool. My, this is the only time you'll ever hear me say that MySQL is cool. MySQL has a special data engine type just for um, long-term storage. That means it understands really slow reads and writes and it won't kill the server while you're doing it. Um, security, data separated. You can add permissions so people can't read things they're not supposed to see. Uh, recovery and uptime. Each of the tables is smaller. So if you need to restore just one table, it's going to load back faster because there's less data in it. Um, load balancing, you can spread it across multiple disks. That means the workload is shared across multiple disks, just like a RAID array. I mean, our primary server before we moved everything to AWS at work had two, had dual RAID 5s in it. So it was a RAID 5 mirroring to a RAID 5, and I just don't remember what the heck that number's called. It's like RAID 10 or something. No. No, it's something else like RAID, it was a weird number. But essentially you had a RAID 5 array that was basically raided to another RAID 5 array. Um, that's where all our financial information for the company was. So we could, I could literally just go rip a dry, dry drive out while it was running it, it would never know. We tried it just to make sure it would actually survive and it did. Like literally, the lights went red for 30 seconds and they went green again. It grabbed the extra disk and rebuilt itself in like 20 seconds. It's kind of cool. Now, disadvantages of partitioning, inconsistent access speed. In other words, let's say you got one partition on a really busy disk and other partitions on a not so busy disk. The less important data might be on the less busy disk. It'll still come back faster because the other one's busy. The hole's only so big, right? A bathtub can drain only so fast because the pipe is that big around. There's only so much water that can go down that hole. Same thing, if the, the disk is really, really busy, the partition's gonna take a, it's gonna suffer. Partitions are usually non-transparent unless you're using Oracle, which I mentioned, which supports both horizontal and vertical partitioning transparently. It looks like one table, but it actually creates tables on the fly to handle the partitions. There is a reason why people pay for Oracle. That's one of them. Um, extra space and update time. The problem is data gets duplicated. Primary keys are duplicated across every table. So you end up having access, you know, you have to make sure all the data stays in sync, otherwise you lose data. Um, heck, I already discussed this. All right, now there's one other kind of partitioning which is not discussed here. Um, we're supposed to discuss horizontal and vertical partitioning, uh, but there's one other kind that's becoming really, really popular. It's called sharding. Not sharting. Sharding with a D. It's not the accident. Because I know whenever I say it, everybody gets a giggle. They're like, yeah, you said the stupid word. No, he didn't. It's called sharding. So essentially what happens is instead of a vertical partition where you're taking one table and splitting it up, you're actually cloning the database across multiple servers. So that Everybody has a common login page. So you come in, you hit the login page. After you've logged in, it determines what shard you live on. And 
you get shunted to that shard. The best example for everybody in here is WoW. Right? Oh, you sign up. You have to sign up for a specific server, right? Or you used to. I don't know if it's still like that. I haven't played in a long, long time. Or, you know, when back in my day, it was Ultima Online was the big one. And you logged into an instance, right? You picked an instance of a server, East Coast, West Coast. But if your friends were on the East Coast and you were on the West Coast, you couldn't play together. Because your data was sharded. Your data resided on one server, they resided on another. And the way this, with games, people tend to pick whichever one's closer to them. But other services such like, there's an example one where it's, um, there's a real estate portal out there where um, when a real estate agent signs up, he gets assigned a, a shard at random. All his customers, when they register against him, reside in that shard. That means that his customer's data is only in that one instance and not on any of the others. Which means the database is smaller, the queries are faster. But then we have data redundancy issues where we don't have redundant data. So then we end up having you know, more backups and that kind of stuff. But sharding is a very popular tool. I know, every time I say the word sharding, people giggle. They can't help themselves. It's so mature. Now, uh, there's currently two servers out there that support native sharding. And right now, there's Oracle and Postgres. Postgres has a plugin for it, an extension. You install it, you define your database as a sharded database, and you tell it how many shards it's going to run on. So you tell it, okay, here's four Postgres servers running side by side. You add them to the cluster, and away it goes. And the primary machine in the front starts assigning data to the different clusters. And it'll pull the data out automatically based on whatever you've told it. And the plugin has been added up, up till it has been updated so well now that you can actually do a query across multiple shards. So you can ask for all customers. You can tell it, get it a shard one or get it from all the shards. It'll actually pull it from all the shards and give you a complete select star from customers from all your shards. Um, the only thing it can't do is set operations. You can't do union and accept or an intercept across shards. If you need to do that kind of stuff, you're probably going to need Oracle, and at that point, it can do it. All right. The views. This is exam material, just so you know. I'm done charting. See? Got to get that last giggle in. Views. Views are relations, except they're not usually physically stored. When I s use this example, and every time I say this, I, my database prof, who lives currently in Sudbury, would lose his mind if he heard me use this example. Picture it as a bookmark. You wrote a really complicated query And then you save it in the de you save the definition of that query with a nice name. What does that sound like? You go to your browser, you go hit your toolbar, hit your bookmark, and you go back to some website with a really long URL because you didn't want to remember how to go back to that spot without having to you know the magic Google you did to get there in the first place, or you know it's just this big dive through the website to get to you whatever. So. Views allow you to write complex queries and store them. And how do you create it? You literally go create view instead of create table, give it a name, just like you would a table, as, and then it's your query that's afterwards. So you go create view developers as, and you go select name project for employees or department is equal to development. Bang. It'll give you, only if you go select start from developers, you get everything, but only the ones that live that live inside the development department. The view builds, you know, subset. Now, you could create a view that does your joins for you, such as this. 
So select buy or sell your product store from persons, join per purchase on, you know, here's the join. That's a really terrible example. The query looks awful. Where the person's in Seattle, and that will give you everybody who bought something in Seattle without you having to do a join, without you having to do a where. It creates a virtual table. And you can use it. And this uses the old style joins. It gives you an idea how old this slide is. Uh, select name, comma store from Seattle view, comma product, where you know there's the join. And it's uh, the product category is shoes. You can use a view just like a normal table. It even respects the indexes behind the scenes. But what it does is when you create the view, it stores two things. It stores the definition of the view, as in what is the SQL statement that defines the view? And it also stores the query plan. So the first time you run that view, it looks at it goes, oh, this is the best way to solve this query. And it stores the query plan along with the view so that next time you pull from the view, there's less thinking because it's already done the, ma the math behind the scenes. So if here's that previous view we had, right, where we had the Seattle view concluded, it'll take this query and turn it into this query on the fly. So it'll take a really a simple query because you created a view that does the join and turns it into this. So everything that's red is, for the most part, is stuff coming from the Seattle view. So, so that's a virtual view. They're also known as dynamic views, as in they exist, they run at all times. They're not stored. That means they're computed on demand. There's overhead, but they're always fresh. The data is always fresh. So in other words, it shows you live data just up to the moment. They're great if you want to um, create limits for your users or you don't want them to see certain pieces of the data. Or if it's how it used to be, where the database structure was really strange before all these nice rules were put in place. And you wanted the developers to actually have simplified views of the data, you'd create a bunch of views for them and they'd hit the views instead of the actual database. They didn't even need to know all the complex SQL. They just need to know select star from uh, user view. And it would give them the records back that joined the users, their uh, access levels, maybe what country they're in, last time they logged in, all that stuff all being pulled in at once. There's also something called materialized views. Materialized views are used in data warehouses for the most part. They're pre-computed offline. Now what does that mean? It means that the view is run and then the data is stored. So essentially all the materialized view is, is a table. It's just a fancy kind of table. So it behaves like a table, it looks like a table, there's data inside of it. The problem with materialized views is the data could be stale. Um, for example, you have a table that summarizes daily sales and it runs at midnight every day. That means that your data as of midnight that day is up to date. But by the time 5 o'clock the next day comes around, your summarized data does not have any of the current transactions that have happened since midnight. So your data is stale, it's not up to date. So often, a lot of servers will have routines that run at night that update all the materialized views. Companies like Amazon have lots of materialized views as they summarize their stuff into data warehouses. Um, Postgres has a specific kind of view and it's literally called create materialized view. It treats it more like a view than a table uh, MySQL does not have materialized views. You create a table and you just keep updating it all the time. So you truncate the table, reinsert the data into it every night. It's expensive. Or if all you're doing is the daily snapshot, you don't need to truncate the table, you just summarize the last 24 hours and shove it into that table. And now maybe once a month, actually purge it and rebuild the entire table because you might have some weird, you know, 11.59 to 12.01 overlap issues where, you know, you might have a transaction that, uh, that overlapped inside that time frame and the numbers aren't quite right. Um, 
But materialized views are views where the data is static and it doesn't change. So that's an important thing to know. Um, not saying there's any questions on the exam about it, but you should know what a materialized view is, which is basically a static view that needs to be manually updated. All right. You can create updatable views. However, how do you insert data into a table that doesn't exist? So for example, a view is a virtual table. The table does not exist. The definition of the data, how to retrieve it, exists. So if you want to create something that's updatable, as in you can insert into a view, update a view, or delete the view, like the data inside the view, you have to contain every primary key for every table in the, in the view. All mandatory fields, in other words, what's a mandatory field? Not null. Any column that is not null must be in the view. You must supply values for all the primary keys if they're not auto-generated. If you're using surrogate keys that auto-generate, congratulations, you have less of a problem. You must supply values for all mandatory fields. So if you're joining users and orders and you want to update or add a new row, you'd have to supply everything that's mandatory for the user and for the order in one go. <coughs> Not a lot of people use them because they're such a pain to use. Okay. Now, I know that was an info dump. The PDF does a really good job of it also. All right, I'm going to talk about assignment number two now. That's, I love the way that's the first question people ask. No, it's individual. You don't have to deal with sucky partners anymore. Nice. Um, you don't have to deal with partners that are busy playing Overwatch instead of doing their work. Or insert other game here. Whatever it may be. Okay, here's the deal. Originally, this was actually a more complex assignment, and I decided to tune it back a bit again this term. Um, because realistically, I don't, I'm not a big fan of reevaluating people on stuff they've already been evaluated on. And I've already evaluated you guys and your database design skills, so I decided not to reevaluate the guys on that. So I'm giving you guys a design. There it is. It's simple. One, two, three, four, five, six tables. You will do the following things. In actual fact, I just ignore that. It shouldn't say at least seven tables. It's six tables. Um, I, need to f I apparently need to update my first sentence again. You, what you will do is you will give me test data. You also provide me with the table creation routines. Actually, let me update this so that I can make sure that this is all correct. I hacked and slashed this on Monday. I get rid of that. I swear I fixed this. There, that's better. No, nope, there's still a problem. There we go. All right, so you're going to give me the table creation routines. In case you don't know what table creation routines are, those are the create table statements. One of the challenges you guys are going to have are going to discover is there's a certain order you got to do it in. You can't just say create this table if it depends on another table. You got to figure out the order to create the tables in. You're going to create you're going to provide me with some sample data and its creation routines. Those, that's known as insert statements. Again, those have to happen in a certain order. You will figure out how to make it happen in the right order. In other words, you can't insert a child record unless the parent record exists. You will provide five queries 
based on that design and the data you've provided, you're going to select a customer by phone number. Sounds easy. That's lab seven. Lab eight. Lab eight. Lab eight. This is all lab eight and nine, by the way. Um, select all calls related to a single customer created by a specific employee. Select all calls with the following data provided. And selecting the average number of calls per customer. So there's an aggregate function in this. You will give me a single file, one SQL file. In this file, you'll have all your table creation routines, all your insert statements, and then the five queries at the end. And I, what I will do is, uh, number one, as I run the tool through a d uh, duplication check, of course, you guys are all creating the tables and it should all look roughly the same, except the test data. When I run it through my duplication checks, the test data chunk and maybe the queries should look different. The first part should look roughly the same for everyone. Number two, as I take your file, I copy paste it into my SQL tool and I hit run. And I start taking points off for every mistake I have to fix. If it runs clean, if it runs clean, you get all your points in one go. The only reason I'm running it through the duplicate check routine is in the past I've had students try to be clever and they get their friend that's clever that knows how to write SQL, do it for them, and then they change their name. And I'm like, like honestly, guys, how stupid do you think I am? If I, you guys run, I get four guys in a row that all have similar names. And I run all four of their assignments in a row. And they all select the same customer out of the database. You think I'm not going to notice? I'm not that inobservant. There's a little bit of your own work you have to do in this. I mean, I don't mind if you help each other out a little bit, but, you know, try to do some of it on your own. Just a little bit. Give me something here to work with. Uh, but essentially, if I put it in my file and I hit run, and it runs clean, you get um, 28, how much is it? 20, 30 points instantly. I can, make, I can make fun of him. He's been quiet all class too. And then, you get one point if you name your file correctly. In assignment number one, six groups lost their points because they either A, didn't name the file pro properly, or B, they gave me the wrong file type. So for those of you that don't know what an SQL file is, it's a text file. Plain text file with a .SQL extension. That's all. No, don't give me a spreadsheet. I will beat you. I will find you, and I will beat you. I have a special set of skills for people like you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a place in hell for people like that. So you will give me an SQL file. I will run it. If there's mistakes, I will start fixing them. If essentially what happens is if I have to fix eight mistakes in your table creation routines, you lose all eight points for your table creation routines. I don't care if they're pretty much right. Every mistake is one point. Test data, 12 points. Again, for every insert statement I have to fix, one point off the top. Queries. Now, I'm giving you two points each. This one I'm being a little more forgiving. You get a point for it. Do you have the right idea? And did it run? So if you have the right idea but it didn't run, you'll get your points. You'll get one point. If it runs and you have the wrong idea, but you're just off a little bit, you'll still get one point. I mean, if you give me select star from customers for all five, well, obviously you're not going to get your points. But I, that one there has a little bit of forgiveness in it. In other words, if you got the right ideas and you create a table with the right joins and stuff and you made a typo somewhere, I'll fix it and you get one of the two points for it. 
All right, it is due. Due November 20th by 11.30 p.m. The drop dead date is November 27th. So what does that mean? If you get it to me by the 20th, you get your full points. Well, the potential for your full points. Between the 20th, 20th and the 27th, you get the potential for 90% of your points. Right, 10% penalty. After the 27th, you make it the easiest assignment to grade. Because I just go zero, 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 zero. It takes me like 10 seconds to just blank people out. Like a whole block of people, gone. Which also leads me into the next statement. Next week is a work period for both the lecture and the labs. And if I'm right, you're getting close to uh, midterm number two in most of your other classes or a load of assignments. So it kind of works out well since this is a work period. Realistically, this should take you guys four to six hours to do at worst. Unless you haven't A, been paying attention, B, you don't know how to Google. Or C, you spent the entire class playing Overwatch. Or PUBG. Or Fortnite. Or whatever the hell else you happen to be playing. So it's really usually roughly four to six hours to do. You will be given a lab period and a lecture period to work on it. If you have problems, come and see me. That's what I'm here for. Um, what else should you be working on? Labs 8 and 9, because you should try to get those done, because they'll help you with this stuff. Yes? Next week, all week is work periods. Blanket statement. Which leads me to the next statement. Test number two is not being assigned today. I'm assigning test number two starting next week. I'm giving you guys an extra week to help go through what's, what's in the slide, go through the PDFs, so that you have a chance to actually review a little bit before you take on the second test. It'll be assigned to next week. It'll be online. Take home. You've got a week to do it. Find somewhere quiet to do it. Sit down and do it. And that'll be that. And that'll be the last evaluation point. Yes. It's just like the last one. That's what I just said. Literally, I think I'm pretty sure I said just like the last time, you got a week to do it. 90% sure I said it. I might 10%. You're just double checking. Okay. Right. So, you have a week to do it. You can save and come back. You get how many attempts, everyone? One. And this time I'm not going to do, because last time I allowed a couple people some restarts because they didn't understand the rules of engagement. You've been through one of my tests now. You know the rules of engagement. I'm not giving people restarts. Oh, hey, I did the test and I got like 7 out of 29. I didn't know I was allowed to use the book. It's a take-home test. What do you think? Yes, it's open book. It's open PDF. It's open slideshow. It's open Google. It's not open the person sitting next to me or the other person on Discord. Do not use the group Discord. You'd be surprised who has accounts on it. There's been several discords that have been run over the years, and I just find one and I get myself added. There's always a friendly student that's willing to let me know what it is. So, who's the snitch? Well, the fact that I told you not to use Discord and you use it makes you a, th a liar. So, don't use it, because I'll know. And even if I don't have an account, I can just say, how many of you guys use Discord during the test? And I guarantee there'll be at least three of you going to go, shit. So, yes, don't ask anybody else for the answers to the test. Do it yourself. There's lots of places you can look up answers in the booklets, in the slides, in my class recordings. Google will also help you. 
There's no reason to ask the guy next to you. Or the other the, the whole group in Discord. Like honestly. So that's it for today. See you guys next week or in lab. <laughs>